the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. A very warm welcome to Squawk Box this Friday morning. We are live in London, of course, with Karen and Arabide and myself, Steve Sedgwick, here in Bari, Italy, for the G7 meeting. These are your headlines. So the group of seven signing off on a $50 billion deal for Ukraine, using the proceeds from frozen Russian assets as it sends a powerful message to the Kremlin. Russia has to pay. Uh, there is a blatant violation of the international law. There is a blatant uh, aggression against the Ukraine. They are the aggressor. There is a victim. There, there are uh, rules at the international level. They have to pay. Stocks slide and the yen slides uh, as the Bank of Japan plays it safe, keeping rates on hold, but teasing quantitative tightening is coming. A Tesla shareholders a preview on Musk's massive $56 billion pay package for the second time, the largest public company compensation in history. Going for growth, Labour leader Keir Starmer puts the economy at the heart of his pitch to voters as a new poll puts the governing Conservative Party into third place. Stability over chaos, long term over short term, an end to the desperate era of gestures and gimmicks, and a return to the serious business of rebuilding our country. There's a lot happening on the ground where Steve is located in Bari as G7 leaders have agreed a deal to provide around $50 billion in loans for Ukraine, backed by the profits from frozen Russian assets. Funding is expected to be delivered by the end of the year, with all G7 states participating. U.S. President Joe Biden and Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky have signed a bilateral security agreement. The agreement formalizes the current level of U.S. support for the country for 10 years in a bid to commit future administrations to supporting Ukraine. Our goal is to strengthen Ukraine's credible defense and deterrence capabilities for the long term. A lasting peace for Ukraine must be underwritten by Ukraine's own ability to defend itself now and to deter future aggression anytime in the, in the future. The United States is going to help ensure the Ukraine can do both, not by sending American troops to fight in Ukraine, but by providing weapons and ammunition, expanding intelligence sharing, continuing to train brave Ukrainian troops at bases in Europe and the United States, enhancing interoperability between our militaries in line with NATO standards, investing in Ukraine's defense industrial base so in time, in time, they can supply their own weapons and munitions. Well, Steve was at that press conference with the U.S. president yesterday and joins us uh, from the G7 and Bari. Steve, a uh, breakthrough when it comes to Ukraine here, but also plenty on the agenda today as the Pope takes centre stage talking about AI. Yes, he does. And I know that's of particular interest to yourself. And so I, I won't say too much about that as well. I, do, I mean, from a moral and from a human point of view, I, I think there's going to be a lot of emphasis on that uh, from the Pope as well. But I, I will park that story just for now. And I think maybe we'll cover it in a little bit more detail uh, when I'm back in the studio um, on Monday as well. But, but look, it was absolutely fascinating. Your, your correspondent and fantastic camera mics and um, producer George, we've, we've had about four hours sleep because we actually finally um, managed to get into the enclave yesterday evening. First of all, we got into the Leaders' Summit itself which is, oh, it's about 60 kilometres up the road. And, and I've got to be honest, in fact, Mike, go and take the shot. It's a beautiful morning here in Bari as well. Um, but we, we went virtually to Brindisi, Frasano, to this, um, this amazing enclave where the, the leaders are. And it, I can I tell you, in a, in a press coach, it takes a very, very long time as well to get that 60 kilometres up the coast as well. Uh, and then from there, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we were doing there in a few moments' time, we actually got taken in a smaller shuttle to a more uh, kind of um, more discreet enclave where President Joe Biden and Vladimir Zelensky had this press conference as well in front of about, about, I don't know, about 30, 40 journalists. So it was a very tight gathering as well. Uh, and we had to wait a long time. It was due to start at seven and it started about quarter to nine. You know how these things work, Karen. But it was absolutely fascinating looking at the body language and the mood music as well from both presidents as well, from Zelensky uh, and indeed from Joe Biden. There was palpable relief, I think, uh, from the Ukrainians that they're actually making some, some decent progress uh, finally on getting the right kind of 
kind of financing, the right kind of defence systems, the right kind of commitments uh, from G7, from NATO and others uh, towards basically shoring up their position. Because let's be brutally honest, their position on the battlefield has been stunningly challenged, especially in the east, especially in Kharkiv in recent days as well. So there was a lot in that press conference as well, as well, uh, a, a limited number of questions afterwards. But it was fascinating, as you quite rightly said, and I thought your link in was, was perfect, Karen, about the, the, the subtlety of that would be trying to keep future administrations uh, from going back on the commitments as well. As you say, a 10-year commitment with Americans, and as I was talking with Sherry on Capital Connection, a 10-year commitment from the Japanese as well. We're going to see a lot more of that over the next couple of days. But, but the centerpiece, uh, as you also said, and as we mentioned in the headlines, was this freezing up uh, of finance. And we'll talk to Carl Weinberg about this, amongst other things, in a short while as well. But the, the unfreezing of, of future capital flows from these frozen Russian assets, a lot of questions about those assets themselves. But I spoke to Charles Michel about this, the, the, the president of the EU Council, uh, and just about what progress has been made and, and about how actually a lot of the technicalities, we still don't know how they're going to surmount those obstacles that we mentioned yesterday. Let's listen in to Charles Michel. We sent a very powerful signal to the Kremlin. We are not intimidated. We are determined to support uh, Ukraine for as long as it takes. And it's very concrete. This operational 50 billion euros in addition for Ukraine. It means more military equipment and, and more, more capacities and capabilities uh, for Ukraine to defend themselves and to defend our common European values. But moving beyond the Sherpas to the heads of state and the agreement, there are so many technicalities uh, and issues under the hood as well. How are you going to surmount all those obstacles in a very timely fashion? Look, we have started to work on this proposal a few weeks ago, and we had uh, in-depth discussions at the level of the Sherpa in preparation of this G7 meeting. It means, it means that uh, we went very far, and I'm very confident that in the weeks to come, we can finalize all the details so that this money can be available for Ukraine as soon as possible in the months to come. But this is money that potentially is relying on the income from the circa 300 billion euros worth of frozen assets. What if the war were to end, which we all hope it will, and those assets need to be given back to the Russians? Who's going to underwrite these loans? Well, it's an interesting question, but uh, my, my answer is very uh, simple. Russia has to pay. Uh, there is a blatant violation of the international law. There is a blatant uh, aggression against the Ukraine. They are the aggressor. There is a victim. There, there are uh, rules at the international level. They have to pay. And that's why uh, those, uh, the, 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 this, this money is uh, blocked. That's why this uh, money is uh, frozen. And I'm very uh, confident that we can use this money to support the Ukraine because this is fair. I'm going to get very editorial here on this as well because it's just my impression, having been to a lot of these kind of meetings and seen a lot of this diplomacy over the years as well, my impression, this is not what the leaders have said to me, is that the Russians are going to find it very, very difficult to ever get that money back, OK? Because ostensibly this money is going to be used, this, this, this income stream which is going to be monetized, is going to be used for the defence of Ukraine. It's going to be used for the shoring up their economy. It's going to be shore, used for shoring up their, their energy infrastructure as well. It's also going to be used, and this was a, a point that was raised in some of the, the, the comments from these world leaders, it's also going to be used for the rebuilding of Ukraine. Now, I've been to one reconstruction construction conference. There's been a couple of them as well. And we're going to get a peace conference this weekend in Switzerland as well. The bill for reconstruction for Ukraine is probably in the trillions of dollars, or certainly it's well over hundreds of billions of dollars. So you're talking somewhere between half a trillion and, and, and a trillion plus as well to reconstruct. If this money and this frozen asset is going to be used towards the repaying of the reconstruction. You can see my math here, my logic here as well. If people are saying this money has to go towards the reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, but actually we're not using the asset itself, we're just using the, the income from that as well. I, I think it, it paints a very obvious picture. That's just my view on this one. Very quickly, I'll just raise the points. I think there was a lot done yesterday. One, the bilateral security agreement, which we just talked about as well, between Zelensky uh, and the United States as well. Two, the G7 deal on financing. Three, Three, Karen, as we've talked about in recent days, the tightening of the sanctions regime on secondary players and indeed the, those who would be financing the, the Russian industrial military machine as well. Uh, and four, and this is the most important bit, given everything else we've been talking about as well, China. 
I, I think there's going to be some really implicit co- uh, criticism of China over the next 24 hours as well. And I think it's going to make its way into the communique as well. I think that potentially is going to ratchet up the pressure between the West, between the US and China as well, uh, and could have big ramifications. And I know our next guest thinks uh, in, in similar lines as well. Karen Arabile, back to you. Steve, great coverage. It's funny, isn't it? The news gathering can take a lot more effort sometimes to get sound bites. Uh, terrific work there on the ground in Italy. Well, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has told CNBC the country's ballooning debt load is manageable, provided it remains at the current level. Yellen said rather than the headline figure, attention should focus instead on the net interest costs Washington is paying. If the debt is stabilized relative to the size of the economy, that we're in a reasonable place. Um, the way I look at it is that we should be looking at the real interest cost of the debt. That's really what the burden is. And um, in the budget the president presented for this coming fiscal year, um, he proposes $3 trillion of deficit reduction over the next decade. And that's sufficient to basically keep the debt-to-income ratio stable. Yellen also said she is encouraged by signs of an easing labour market and that it's no longer putting a strain on the fight against inflation. The labour market has become a little less hot, a little bit more normal. The number of job openings has declined some. We've had a burst in labour force participation. And so the labour market now is resembling what it looked like pre-pandemic. Wages are increasing, but... Um, at a slower rate, and so that doesn't really look like it's a threat to inflation. Well, it may not be as sexy as CPI or maybe even the FOMC decision, but U.S. producer prices for the month of May unexpectedly fell on the month. The PPI index declined 0.2% versus what economists had anticipated for a 0.1% increase. So this went down, right? So another slowdown then in inflation prices. On the annual basis, though, producer prices rose 2.2%. That's down 10 basis points from April's figure. The print is further evidence of cooling inflation stateside due in large part then to lower energy costs. So what does that mean then for the Fed? Would they have changed their dot plot predictions maybe? Now, another data point, U.S. initial weekly jobless claims rose to a 10-month high coming in at 242,000 and well above estimates. Now, the figure points to steady cooling in that labor market as the Fed's rate hikes, as well as the battle against inflation, transmit right through to the economy. Now, here's an interesting one. Continuing claims, meanwhile, those increased to just 1.8 million. So what does that all meant then for the market? Well, again, another record-setting day really across the board. In fact, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq are the ones to make note of here in terms of record-setting. It was the fourth consecutive record-setting day then, particularly for the S&P 500. But just to give you some clarity really on how it's gone this year, we're in the middle of June, right? And we've actually just seen the S&P 500 hit record highs 29 times this year, 17 times then for the tech-heavy Nasdaq. Even for the week, both indices are set to move higher. The S&P 500 could move up 1.6%, 3.1% so far on the up then for the Nasdaq. Again, it's all of those tech counters, the likes of NVIDIA, the likes of even Apple actually managing to find some gains then at the back end of this week so far. Of course, on the back of that AI boom after WWDC. Now, Treasuries, well, that PPI data that we've just pointed towards, well, that's kind of moved things ag- along again following the CPI print, which is already softer than the market had anticipated. So you saw another drawdown then in these yields with the 10-year note going back to 426 of course, that had even hit, had even hit 4.25 then on the back of the CPI print and the Fed, having said that they anticipate just that one cut at the very least this year. On the two-year, the more rate-sensitive uh, two-year note then, 4.72 is where we're currently sitting on that one then as well. Um, of course, you are seeing markets across the board just look towards those rate cuts across the United States. On to where the currencies then are sitting this morning then. Front foot, particularly for the dollar. A lot of that has been helped then by gains against the euro, and as well as a few safe haven bids on that front. So much so that the euro, which is marred in uh, some political turmoil, shall we say, was headed for what is a weekly loss then this time. At the same time, though, the yen is on the defensive. 
Well, almost touching 158 is pretty much where we're seeing uh, the mark for it. A one and a half month low, in fact, uh, for the dollar yen at this point. On track for weekly losses, uh, slumping near that mark. In fact, this year, it's down 10% is the yen against the US dollar. On to the Asia market then overall here. Well, markets are mixed after the Bank of Japan did keep its interest rates on hold, saying things should remain as they are. But here's the interesting part. It is considering the reduction of its purchase of JGBs after the next meeting. The market had perhaps anticipated that would be a little bit earlier than where we are right now. But July 30 to 31st, that's when the next meeting is. Perhaps then is when they'll reduce their bond buying. You're seeing the Shanghai Composite then down with the Hang Seng also losing out. But the Nikkei managing to move higher after that rates decision, Karen. Let's get to Carl Weinberg, who is Chief Economist and Managing Director, High Frequency Economics. Carl, it's been a busy old week. We've got served up more grey area by the Fed as it waits it out, looking for more confidence before cutting rates. That said, the market has been somewhat resilient this week, still anticipating two rate cuts as well. What do you make of the wash-up from the Fed and some of the, the tame prints that we've been seeing on the CPI and the PPI numbers? Yeah, good morning, Karen. You know, it's been an interesting week for the Fed. The Fed told us on Wednesday what they wanted to do. Uh, And then on Thursday morning, yesterday morning, the market came out and they immediately rebelled against what the Fed uh, told them they were going to do and said, well, we think you're going to do something else. And that was driven by the CPI number, uh, which came out just before the Fed meeting, and by the PPI number that printed yesterday, both of which were lower than expected. And I think that uh, now the, 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 the action moves toward the Fed. The Fed will be sending out its speakers starting today to convince the markets that they really meant it when they said they were only thinking about cutting rates one more time. So we've got three Fed speakers coming up today. We have Mester, we have Cook, and we have Goolsby, two of them being voters on the committee and all three being participating in the discussion. And now the Fed has to go out and tell the markets that they're being a little bit, uh, I hate to use this phrase, but I will, irrationally exuberant in betting on two or more rate cuts before the end of the year, and that they really meant it when they uh, made their statement on Wednesday. And I think that's the next evolution in all of this, a bit of a pullback from this uh, optimism about uh, rate cuts uh, being more than the Fed told us about. Carl, the lack of confidence that the Fed has, some of that stemming from the success of the labour market in recent years, the real strength that we've seen in employment. The Economist has been musing about the difference in some of the data points, saying if you look at a survey of employers, about 1.2 million jobs added uh, since the start of the year in net terms. But if you look at a separate survey, you get a very different picture. This is from the household surveys, where in fact the economy has shed around 100,000 jobs. Uh, The Economist is saying, well, there are different factors at play around migration and the gathering of uh, some of the business data on the back of COVID. But what do you think the actual picture looks like when it comes to the employment market? Is it softening? Is it going to provide the Fed some clarity this year? So two questions there. First of all, what do I think about the labor market? And that is no matter which survey you look at, we're pretty darn close to full employment. And that's the way I'd like to think about the U.S. economy right now. We are at full employment, we're growing, and inflation is slowing. That's the big picture. And then we can take out the microscope and zero in on this number or that number or the other number. But all the indicators of the labor market are in the realm of a very strong economy. Now, you look at the initial claims number that we got yesterday morning in the United States. So the number went up to 242,000 from 229,000. And oh my goodness, it's been rising uh, from uh, about 200,000 over the last few weeks. And gosh, it looks like we're the, the numbers are getting worse. And they are because the economy is gradually slowing. But if we look at actual recessions that we've experienced over the last 50 years, all right, the number of unemployment claims jumps to figures like 350, 450, 50, 600, even 700 uh, in, in the various recessions that we've had over the last five decades. So while the numbers are rising, they're rising slowly, and the levels of any of these numbers are inconsistent with an imminent risk of a recession. Now, this could change quickly, but until they do, the data we have are telling us that the U.S. economy is still quite strong. Yeah, Carl, I often look at, um, you know, in case of emergencies, there's a there's really just close to uh, something that says break glass in case of emergency, right? Yeah, you reach for something when things often look uh, a bit sideways. You made note of the labor market and you think, you know, yeah, close to, clo- close to full employment. 
But when it reaches 4%, and maybe it goes above that mark, do you not then break glass then in, in, in case of an emergency? Does the Fed then not have to react to that? Do you really think 4% is anything other than full employment, give or take measurement error? Do you think it's really that different statistically from 3.5 or 3.6 or 4.2 or 4.3? Uh, let, let's put this in perspective. 242,000 initial claims for unemployment this morning, a really big number, higher than expected. Break the glass, some would say. But we look back to the last time that we saw a number in the 240 to 250 range printing for initial claims, and we have to go all the way back to 1968 in order to find a number that low. So, yeah, claims are rising. Yeah, there's noise in the numbers. Yeah, maybe the economy is slowing and a few more people are getting laid off now than before. But we are at full employment, and the real problem that the Fed faces and the real risk that the Fed faces is that the economy grows too fast when it's at full employment and triggers another round of inflation. Because when you're at full employment, you can't produce any more stuff with the workers that you have because there, because there are no more idle workers sitting around looking for jobs. The only way to grow is through productivity gains and growing productivity is an art, not a science. And neither politicians nor economists are very good at making it happen. Indeed, they're not. Carl, it's lovely to uh, hear your thoughts this morning. Look, I'm down in Bari, Italy. Someone's got to do it, I guess. Uh, but I was actually had a chance to read your, your note this morning on the, the G7. And, and I actually, I thought you hit the absolute le ne the key point here. Confiscating the money of bad guys seems like the right thing to do. But, and this is your words, it violates, violates almost every principle of financial law, uh, practice and fiduciary responsibility. I hear what you're saying, but, but when a country invades another country, that, that breaks a few laws as well. So just holding back their assets and using that against them, it makes total sense, doesn't it, Carl? Well, Steve, you know, everything you say is right, okay? We can condemn the Russians for what they did, and there are precedents in law for confiscating the assets of countries that don't do, don't behave as they're supposed to. So yes, we can do this. But it does, number one, undermine the faith and confidence in the fiduciary system. There are legal issues to prove that Russia is violated by enough uh, in order to be able to seize its assets. And there's the risk that this game will turn around on us, which has nothing to do with either law or what's right or what's wrong, but with what the other side thinks is right or wrong. Russia's ally in this war is China. And China owns a lot of U.S. assets. And there could be retaliation by Russia and its allies against these kinds of financial moves. I can't predict that. I can only worry that there are risks associated with this. This is not a costless operation. This is not taking a couple of billion dollars from Saddam Hussein or taking cash from Fidel Castro's bank deposits to reimburse victims of his uh, aggression. Right? This is a, a, a lot of money, a major country, a major seizure of assets, and assets that we have also counterpart assets on the other side of the fence. So I don't know how this works out, okay? I find it a little bit scary, and I don't know what the implications are. I, I hear you, um, but I don't think a lot of this is necessarily about Russia at this G7, Carl, and I think we're on the same page. I think this is about the bigger concerns about China as well. And I see nothing that is an olive branch towards China here. I see everything that is trying to face down China. You made a very interesting point. A lot of these politicians have got domestic problems, domestic battles, past, present and future as well. They, they need someone to perhaps ha have, a, as not an enemy, but someone to start blaming a few things on as well. And I think the tensions between the West and China, I can't see anything that's coming out of this G7 that's going to make it better, those tensions. I think it's going to make it worse. Whether that's a right or wrong thing, I don't know. But what do you think? Absolutely, Steve. I mean, you're at the G7. The next page that's going to be turned is the China page. Europe announced the other day the imposition of tariffs on electric vehicles coming from China into Europe, with the highest rates being on BYD, which exported 15,600 vehicles to Europe last year. Okay, They're cruising for a bruising with China. And if they impose tariffs on China, starting with the automobiles and continuing with the chips and the technology, 
technology and more sanctions on chips and technology, there will be repercussions. There will, there will be retribution by China with sanctions on stuff that they sell to us that may be more important than the cars that are at stake. I'm thinking in particular of the vulnerability of the entire new economy to the supply of rare earth coming from primarily China. China plus Myanmar together produce 80% of the world's rare earths. So we have vulnerabilities on both sides. So when we do things like impose tariffs on China or sequester Russia's assets, we have to be aware that it's a big world and we're not the only big players in it. We can be affected by the repercussions and I don't know what they're going to be. Timely reminder, Carl. Thank you very much for the thoughts. Carl Weinberg with us, Chief Economist and Managing Director, High Frequency Economics. On the back of this week's Fed decision, our colleague stateside will be speaking to the Cleveland Fed President, Loretta Mista. Don't miss that exclusive interview today at 14.30 CET. Now coming up on the show, Tesla shareholders approving a historic pay package for CEO Elon Musk. We'll bring you the latest after the break. Plus, it's change coming to the UK. The opposition Labour Party unveiling its manifesto with economic growth front and centre. We'll have the details later this hour. And preparations are underway for the Paris Olympics. Due to kick off next month, we'll hear from the CEO of a key partner, Sodexo, live. Ambition to me is about doing better. I think ambition creates a pathway. The best advice I can give someone starting off a career is don't have a career, have lots of careers, try loads of different things. Talk to people and put your ambition out there. I don't feel that I've hit peak ambition because it's a learning journey. CNBC is where ambition meets opportunity. What does living ambitiously mean to you? Hear it from our CNBC anchors, reporters and global business leaders on CNBC.com. Tesla shareholders have voted in favour of Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package, the largest compensation in history at a public company. The vote comes five months after a Delaware judge ordered the company to scrap the package. Phil LeBeau filed this report. Tesla shareholders have approved a new pay package for Elon Musk that should restore the $56 billion package that was voided by a Delaware judge. We say should because ultimately this has still got to play out in Delaware courts. But the approval by shareholders is clearly a victory for Elon Musk. At the same time, shareholders also approved reincorporation of Tesla from Delaware to Texas. So for Elon Musk, two things that he wanted shareholders to approve ahead of the annual meeting they were approved. And now the question becomes, where does Tesla go from here? During the annual meeting, an, uh, annual meeting, Elon Musk talked about future products, AI development, autonomous vehicles, even the Optimus robot that they are working on. He talked in very glowing terms about the possibilities in the future and where Tesla is headed. But in terms of things you can hang your hat on, in terms of current production, perhaps the most significant is that Cybertruck production is now up to a record 1,300 vehicles a week being shipped. But again, the real news from today's annual meeting for Tesla, the shareholders have approved Elon Musk's pay package, a re reinstatement of the $56 billion pay package that was voided by a Delaware judge. Phil LeBeau, CNBC Business News, Chicago. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market moving news, you can head to cnbc.com. Or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho, and myself, Arabi Lekomete, weekdays on CNBC.